for the past five years um, on virtualization. And I would like to know if you guys have ever heard about Ovid. Anyone? You know, I did. That's good. OpenStack? Yeah, last one. And VMware? OK, so that's a good crowd, probably. Um, I'm here to try and explain why Ovid is a great choice when it comes to managing your, net, your network, your, uh, your virtualized uh, data centers. And I would like to start with a short story. So five years ago, there was a startup named Kumranet. And they had some brilliant engineers. One of them is Avi Kiviti, founder of KDM. And Kumranet had, well, multiple projects, but mostly they focused on KDM. And they, the other project was management. Why do we need management for KDM? Well, that's not the slide I was hoping to see you <coughs> okay. Just a second, for some reason it changed. Okay. So too many sessions, I guess. I had another session earlier this morning. And this was the slide I wanted to mm. see. So this is the option of managing KVM manually, basically. It's nice. It is for Obviously, it is much, much, much better. But then you can use a management solution is needed. So Kubernetes at the time invested time to work on, on the management solution to be able to use KVM and, and to man manipulate the virtual machines in a, in a scale use that friendly manner. So I'm going back to my original slide deck. Yeah. So for me it was, I joined, I joined Red Hat five years ago, and I joined Red Hat because I wanted to work on an open source uh, based project working in Java. And basically what I got, my first task was, you have to work on a closed source project written in C sharp, and you have to somehow make it uh, work uh, on, for us, work for Red Hat, which means convert the platform to work on Linux, etc. So that was my welcome uh, credit to Red Hat. But then, since we came a long way and we have Ovirt, which is written in, well, partly in Java, partly in Python, depends on which uh, component in Ovirt. In, in and that's the way it started for me, anyway. So what is Ovirt about? Ovirt is about managing your virtualized data center. It's tailored for KVM hypervisor. And it's an open source alternative for VMware, for vSphere and vCenter. Who is behind Ovirt? Well, we have some big companies taking place. Uh, Red Hat, obviously, and from there. And there's the IBM and Intel and NetApp, many other good companies that, go, um, that are part of the other governance, uh, governance that we're going to discuss later. So over it was, uh, is by default packaged for Fedora. Uh, there is also packaging for Red and CentOS, of course. The community is working on uh, making it available for Gentoo um, and other flavors. Uh, you can go to the Orbit website and see which community is working on which distribution. But mostly, um, or the focus was, un until not long ago, it was it was definitely Fedora. The Red, which is the Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization Product, is based on that project. So let's see. What are the basic deployments that we want to support? Well, obviously, this is the really basic one. We have the host with multiple virtual machines running on it. Nothing special there. The data center is a logical entity that is a container for all the resources that are required for executing a virtual machine. A more interesting deployment is to have multiple hypervisors, multiple hosts, and virtual machines running on it while it's, um, it's, it's a migration domain. A cluster is a migration domain. It's used for VMs uh, can migrate from one host to another, still at the data center level. 
And the more typical deployment would be multiple data centers. In each one, you have multiple clusters with, with the virtual machines uh, migrating between the two, between the hosts. Okay, so who is a typical object user? We have three flavors. We have the basic sitting penguin, uh, who is a stupid um, consumer, not a stupid, but a basic consumer <laughs> of virtual machines. So all he can do is basically start and stop his virtual machine. Nothing special. There he gets a portal, he gets a UI portal with all the virtual machines. He can start, stop, see the technical parameters of the virtual machine. A more interesting user is the dancing penguin. He can actually create its own virtual machines, and um, he can he can do that based on the quota allocated for him by the administrator. So the administrator basically allocated a CPU, memory, and storage, and he can generate a virtual machine just based on those uh, on those resources. And he can also create the virtual machines based on templates. Template is something I'm going to uh, mention a little bit later. And then we have the Back. This penguin, this nice little penguin, um, with toolbox, he's the administrator. So he has the, this whole toolbox he can use. He can configure the storage and configure the network and can set up virtual machines and create a pool of virtual machines. Uh, the idea is that he should be able to do all, all the exploration, all the configuration, all the stuff he needs within one UI console. So when it comes to management, for me, there are three aspects you should look into. The first one is definitely simplicity. I want to make sure that the management solution I'm using is simple to use, and I'm not wasting my time on configuring the management solution. I need to think about capacity planning. I need to think about the topology of my, of my setup. I don't want to spend my time just deploying and redeploying over, a, and over the management solution. The management solution should be a tool for me to use, not spend my time on. Second objective would be stability. I would definitely want to make sure that the, the management solution I'm using is going to keep my workload up and running. I'm not going to lose my database. I'm not going to lose my disks, my data, my precious data. Well, don't want to lose that. That's definitely stability, the product I would choose for, go for. And the last one is functionality. And that, I believe, is a tricky one. So when, you, when it comes to choosing which type of management solution you, want to, you, want, you need, you have to look into what are your requirements, what the workload you're going to run on that management solution, what kind of features you need, and only then go and look and see if it's available within within the, the specific solution you chose. So we're going to look uh, into those aspects when it comes to all this. Okay, so now here's the slide I was looking for. <laughs> Simplicity. Installation. Okay, so definitely installing your over is quite easy. It's Yam install. If you're using Fedora, it's already packaged. It's there. It's Yam install, and then you do an engine setup. Um, setup is like configuring the database URL, it's password, just basic stuff, and then you go, you're up and running. So from installation point of view, it's quite easy and consumable, I mean, easy to consume. Valid uh, user interaction mechanism. So I would say that each one has its, its, its own flavor of way or its known way to communicate or to use technologies for running or executing things in their management. So for me, it's like, if you use Python, if you like Python, then you've got you know, the Python SDK and you've got the CLI. You have, if you like Java, then you have the Java SDK. You definitely have the, um, the web services that directly you can just use them, consume them, and you have the UI. So from that perspective, you can choose whatever you feel more comfortable with. And there's the overall node. So, uh, so how does this relate to libbird? I mean, is this based on libbird, or is this orthogonal? To libbird? Yes, all, all the VM lifecycle management is done via libbird on the host level. So this is talking about what you do on your the client side, where you have your management interface. It's not talking about the 
installation on the node itself? No, actually, you don't have to go to the node itself. All you you have to do is work with the with the management high level work you would UI. We're going to see a live demo then to probably make more sense. But technically, all the things that are executed on the host level is kind of transparent to the user, unless you want to customize it, customize it, and then you can go to the node and we can see a mechanism for a customizing of the thing. Okay, so there's over the node. We have Mike Burns here with us. So, hey, Mike. <laughs> yeah, so he's the maintainer and uh, the one who's, who's working on that, or used to work on that. Um, anyway, over the node is just enough Fedora to be able to function as a hypervisor. Um, the meaning of that is that Fedora has a lot of packages, and that means a lot of security, potential security holes, potential a lot of administration, and a lot of conflicts uh, that you have. So if you're packaging just enough Fedora, first of all, you get an image which is around 170 megas, which is quite good. Uh, and you don't get all the not useful other packages that you don't want to have on your hypervisor. That's one thing you get from Mobile Node, which makes it more simple to maintain. The other thing is that when you want to add a host to your setup, then you can either add a host via the UI, we are going to see that flow later, or you can use the self-registration uh, flow, which means the host is registering itself on the management node, and all you have to do then is to approve that host. For that, you have to use the overview node, which is the payload image. Configuration. What's some aspect of simplicity in Overt is that you have the configuration, you have like a centralized configuration um, place. You can configure and change configuration for everything that you want in a single place, and that would propagate to all of your setup, which is quite easy, and I think that's it, the simplicity part. Quick start, all you want. So if you want to go and grab over it, all you have to do is, you can, there's a, a POC kind of deployment where you get the engine, the hypervisor, the database, and the storage all located in a single host machine. And it's still easy to consume. You, you, you do the YAM install, but you have to install also the all-in-one plugin. And then you do the engine setup stuff. Uh, you connect to the UI, and there you go. Uh, you've got over it. So I wanted to show you. Uh, live demo. I'm basing my demo on the nested view, so I really hope it's going to behave. Um, what, but I did do some uh, pre uh, preparations, which one of them is that I copied an image into an ISO domain, so I'll be able to use it within uh, to, to start a virtual machine. Technically, that's what I did. In addition to the two steps, I the installation and the configuration. So I, did, I, didn't want to, I didn't want to do the installation now because it takes some time to download all the packages. And I didn't think there's an added value to that, so I skipped that part. But once you're done with the configuration and you log in into the console, all you have to do to start a new VM is to press the new VM dialog. And here you can see you get everything filled out by default. So you have a cluster, you have a data center already defined for you, you also have the local storage defined for you. You need to give it a name. Uh, you can optionally choose a description. For this specific virtual machine, I'm going to boot it from a CD to make sure it's going to be fast enough. OK, so those two images, this is what I did before the session. I copied two images into my ISO domain to, to be able to boot from the CD. That's it. I have a VM. I can add disk and I can add a network, but that's not necessary for, for this specific VM. I just want to make sure you guys see uh, the console. And I just, as you saw, I press the, the start button and the VM is playing right now. So just just before we connect it to the VM, I want you to see there's, there's the main tab for all the main entities. We have the data centers. We can also see it on the screen. On the right hand side, there are two data centers. The local data center was created specifically for the all-in-one um, demo. I mean, automatically, when you deploy an all-in-one, there is a local data center that's being created for you. We have the cluster with a local cluster. You can see the host, which is the, the, the local host I'm running on. 
And here you can see the virtual machine. I just started it, so it's still powering up. But the virtual machine is running on that host. You can see the network storage disk. I want to, I want you guys to see the console. You can connect to the console. In this specific demo, I'm using Spice. Spice is the protocol that is optimized for virtual, for connecting to your virtual machines. It's like VNC, but it's another protocol. And here you can see I'm booting the VM. This is the console to the virtual machine I started. So this is like this is very I hope it's not going to work. Okay. In the meantime, until we get the console, I can also show you something. So for the virtual machine specifically that we've created, we can add disks and add network. We can add a disk. And here you can choose what size this what size disk you want. You can choose which driver you want. Could be Vitaio ID. It, it by default it's thinly provision, but you can reallocate if you want to, for example, if the robot you're using is a server base and you want to get a good uh, performance, it would probably make sense to use the reallocated storage. So let's get the console here. For some reason. The Linux sub is not solving, but that's yeah. Okay. So this is basically what you need to get your VM up and running. If we we'll have time at the end of the slide deck, I would also be able to show you basic stuff like how you add a new interface to your virtual machine and how you add a disk. Okay. So that demo is done. Okay, so this was, this is a schedule three case that I did on didn't work, but it did, so we're fine. Okay, so we're done with simplicity, it's working. Now we're going to work on stability. So obviously we all care about stability. For me, stability means a lot of things. One of the things is, this OVID is used as the as an enterprise grade solution for that it is provided by Red Hat. I think that's quite a good indication about the stability of the product. We have big companies um, supporting OVIRT, so I think that's another good indication, and we have an open governance model. So when we're talking about stability, it's not all about your workload. Definitely, most of it is about your workload, but some of it is about making sure the project is open source, it's going to stay there, and not, not the single company is going to be uh, dominant and only uh, and pull the strings wherever it wants to go. So. An open governance model, which means, which is very based on merit, is a good indication for stability. So if you if you want to influence, you just have to contribute contribute enough uh, to the community and become part of, of this whole project. So I think that's part of stability. When it comes to regular release schedules, we have a six month uh, schedule in Novel. We have a release every six months. We, can, we kind of realized lately that it's too much time between, we have too much time between re releases and we are trying to lower that down. We are trying to lower the cycle for three months because we think we have enough features set on a, on a three months basis. So we're probably going to move to that very soon. Last release was like a few weeks ago, which is over 3.3 and we're looking to release 3.4 within three months. So hopefully that will happen. We have stabilization period in upstream, which means we try not to get new features uh, into the main branch, um, just fixing existing, exist, existing stuff. And we have the community test days. Well, it's always good to test what you're doing, especially if you can. Last test day was, for example, anyone had to test somebody else's feature, which was quite cool, because first of all, it makes me uh, be more aware of the other features that were uh, added to build and in addition, uh, I was able to find things that probably the engineer who designed it didn't think about. So that's good. Next point is continuous integration. On each page in upstream, you have the full uh, test suite that is being executed, and then you get a plus one from uh, Gerrit, uh, from Jenkins in Gerrit, um, making sure that your patch meets the basic standard. We were able. For networking specifically, we were able to do add an, an additional set of tests that is executed on each page, uh, also on the VDSM component. So there are tests per component, VDSM and engine. 
and active user community. One user that is worth mentioning is that the way, which is the which is a hosting facility uh, company in France. The reason I'm mention, mentioning them is because they provide obviously with the continuous integration host. They are hosting for us the continuous integration uh, servers. So I think that's for stability. Functionality. There are two aspects uh, when it comes to functionality. There is the data center level functionality and there is the VM centric uh, functionality. So when we're looking at the data center, it's quite good that you have, in my in my mind, it's that you have all the uh, functionality from one console. You can consume it from one console. So if you want to configure your storage, uh, you do that from within the UI. We can I can show you later how it is done. Um, you you have both uh, iSCSI, which is okay. You have block device uh, storage, and you have the NFS device system storage. Uh, all can be configured within Ovid. Uh, networking, we are currently ha in Ovid. We currently have a, a way to control only um, segregation by VLANs. Uh, so you can use VLANs. Obviously, we don't configure the switches for you, but other than that, we do everything. So, for example, on the host, there's nothing you have to do except for uh, stating the VLAN on the logical network entity. We're using Linux Bridge uh, on the host for, for uh, the network uh, configuration. We added an integration with Neutron lately. Uh, I can get into more uh, details maybe at the end of the session, but generally that enables you to use GRE and VXLAN uh, via Neutron. The integration is, is still quite basic integration. The, the layer 3 services, for example, are not integrated yet. Uh, there is work being done to integrate security group, but uh, the basic stuff, the basic connectivity layer 2 stuff is there. Resilience policy. You can configure, there are two policies that comes out of the box in Ogre. One of them is evenly distributed when you want your workload to be evenly distributed across the hypervisor, and the other one is the power saving policy. So you can use as less uh, physical hardware as uh, as you can, and you can save power on the other uh, physical machines. This is from a high data center level functionality. If we're looking at the VM level, then obviously configuring the disks of the virtual machine, it is all being supported uh, in Ovid and the networking for the specific virtual machine. High availability. You can mark the virtual machine as highly available, and Ovid will be monitoring this virtual machine for you, and will make sure that this virtual machine is uh, is being executed on another uh, host in case in case it crashed in case the hypervisor is not available for some reason something bad happens so you have this uh, monitoring capability by the management layer. <laughs> and obviously some fine tuning you can pass uh, kernel parameters for uh, to KVM into the kernel not the kernel um, for fine tuning stuff. So advanced functionality here it's it's worth uh, discussing which functionality is an added value on top of KVM, I thought, because it's, uh, and which are basically just a driven, it, which is just a driven functionality we are leveraging whatever KVM and Libre has to offer, offer. So the first one is history database and report. What you can get in Overt, in addition to your day-to-day -day work, is reports on and statistics on the capacity and, and the usages of, of your hardware in the past year or months or depends on how you define your report. So by default you have the history database, you can install the report, it is based on Jasper. Uh, or you can create your own reporting tool based on the history database which has an API uh, you could use. The second one, this is obviously not KVM related, right? So the, the second one is a quota, you get the CPU memory and storage uh, you can cut. This is uh, obviously not a uh, it's about KVM. It's a feature that is an added value uh, in, on KVM, on, on the basic virtual machine. Um, what I'm missing here is, is the networking bit, because we, as a user, you get enough quota on the storage and disk and memory to create your virtual machines. There is an aspect, another aspect of quota, which is more quality of service. So I can see it there. The quality of service that you want to cap your uh, traffic uh, of, a thing, of a specific virtual machine not to take all the bandwidth that you have. You want to make sure it is being 
monitored and, and capped and significantly, significantly. One feature that was asked in that aspect for my user only is not available yet. They wanted to be able to cap the VNIC traffic only in case um, the bandwidth is fully utilized. So for example, if, I'm, if I have one gig uh, traffic and only, and we're allocating 100 mega per VM, uh, then if there are no 10 v if there are less than 10 VMs on, on the on the on the physical NIC connected to the physical NIC, then I would like the virtual machine to be able to use more than 100 MIC. So I want to cap the virtual machine only in case um, there is a lot of bandwidth, technically. So this is something we didn't do yet, and I'm not sure if we're going to. I mean, I'm not sure what requirements. Definitely, Libvirt and, and KVM currently doesn't. No, KVM is not related. Libvirt definitely doesn't offer that uh, capability at this point, and we have to look into what needs to be done to be able to expose such feature. So it's like migration. So all layers are, are involved. We have the storage there, and uh, we have uh, KVM, and we have uh, Libvirt, and everything. Everybody, all the component has their own specific contribution for this feature. But still, there was some orchestration level missing that is specific to Ovir that was done, and still, and then and, and still being uh, improved. We have the system scheduler. Currently, in Ovir, you can write your own policy. So, as I mentioned, there are two policies out of the box, but you can write your own policy um, and integrate it and use it in uh, Ovir. It's a new feature that was added uh, in pre re release. So, it's quite nice if you can use anything, any information that is available in the API and, uh, and leverage that for scheduling. This precise. That's, that's the ability to. Well, definitely resize the disk. It's, it's a capability that is not available. In, uh, that is available, but I think it's quite uh, useful. And the lately, we had some issues with that. Never mind. So we have the build this feature. OK, so we have the orchestration level. And this is the benefit of a management solution on top of the uh, on top of the KVM. So we mentioned the scheduler, the VM lifecycle, which is template. When you want to create a VM and you want to create massive virtual machines based on the same on the same image and the same VM configuration, the same amount of memory, the same amount or the same type of CPU, now you have to do is create a template and then you can create mass virtual machines based on that template. Uh, the snapshot, snapshot functionality in Ovi, you can when you're using your application and you want to take a snapshot, um, a point in time when to recover to or to be able to change configuration from that point and then go back to uh, to a well-known stable uh, point in time, then you just use snapshots. You take a snapshot, you play with your virtual machine, you go back to that snapshot, and then you get it all rolled back for you, which is kind of similar to status, status VM that we have to offer in Ovi. You can start a virtual a, a status virtual machine, do whatever you want on that virtual machine. When you stop it, then it goes back to some kind of a pool, and it has no state. It goes back to the way it was when you got it. So if you're looking at a class of students that you want to de to assign uh, virtual machines to, then that's quite a useful feature. You start with a clean image. They can do whatever they want. They can ruin the VM. Once the VM is stopped, then everything goes back to normal. Uh, this protection, Daniel mentioned that in his session earlier on, on Libvirt. So one of the things you can you can get there in KVM is protecting your di your disk. So KVM is, a, is aware of a single virtual machine, but in the management layer we have to be aware if the disk is being used by, by more than a, a single virtual machine at the same time that could definitely cause a corruption. As the management layer, we would like to be able, we would like, and we are doing that actually preventing two virtual machines starting at the same time and writing to the same image uh, concurrently. So we have a disk protection mechanism. The VM high availability, as I mentioned earlier, is something that is built on top of KVM. And the quota, I mentioned all the time. Oh, and one last thing is the MLA. We have the multi-layer admi uh, administration. You can manage. Who can access which VM and who can access which resource in general? Um, 
in your field. So, and you can also delegate those permissions. So if you are the main administrator and you want the network administrator to be able to control only the networking stuff, then what you would do probably is create a dedicated networking administrator role. And, um, and that role would be used for, for the user that is going to configure the network. I can surely hear you. Is the VMHA connecting to live migration case or is that connectivity? What is the HA capability? High availability. What is that? Okay, the VM high availability, that means that we that the management layer is monitoring your virtual machine and then in case it crashes it restarted it on another hypervisor. It restarts the same virtual machine? Yes, the same virtual machine. But it protects what? Do you keep the same state starting from the memory stuff? Yeah. Well if it crashed, probably the state is lost. But that's not high availability. Yes, well, I agree with you. It's some, it's high availability to some degree. It's not like active, active when you get the full uh, memory. Um, it's not full it's it's not Just make sure the the uh, VM is running. Right. Service is right. available. The minimum yeah. downtime. Right. So there's the watchdog emulation available right. available in KVM right now. So we have another feature that is uh, leveraging the KVM. Um, emulated watchdog, and you can choose which action you want to do on a, a specific VM basis. But that's good if the hypervisor is still running and only something bad happened to you, specifically to your virtual machine, like the application, the application itself is not responsive, is not responsive, or etc. But the high availability general mechanism that's for yeah, general, yeah, generally for hypervisor or VM. Okay, um, those are things that things that we ca we currently need, and they are not there. But I think I've already mentioned the inequality of service, no VNC. Okay, so we added a feature in Ovid lately, which is no VNC. Um, it, it, use, it technically it's using it is using WebSocket, which was not uh, merged in upstream KVM, but now I think it is. I saw it like a few days ago. So it, it is available in upstream KVM, so we should be able to get it. At this point, we have some kind of a workaround. We do on the host uh, on the host level. We 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 have a specific client or server that translates everything to VNC, and technically we're using VNC in KVM. A RAM snapshot. The kind of functionality that we have when you take a snapshot with the, with the RAM, which is being to be able to provide a specific uh, a good recovery um, to the original virtual machines that you had. So currently, I think Livvirt or KVM, I'm, I'm not sure in which layer, requires to actually pause the VM. And that's, from the user point of view, it's, it's kind of painful. So this is something we, we're looking to get uh, improvements from either Livvirt or KVM. I'm not sure in which level it is. I'm just using the fact that the other are just sitting here. And both, both levels. <laughs> both okay. levels, right? Okay. Okay, so architecture. Before going through the architecture, I would like to discuss some of the customization options you have in Ovid. So there are two uh, places you can customize. Actually, there are three places you can customize over these days. You can customize it on the node level, um, where our VDSM is executing. So generally, in Ovid, we have the centralized management solution, and we have a, a small agent on each, written in Python, on each of the, uh, of the hypervisor. And he's the one who's generating everything. He's configuring the storage and the network. And other than that, he's also handling the VM lifecycle. Uh, the VM lifecycle basically means creating the DOM XML uh, that is passed later to, uh, to Litvin. <laughs> so what we do enable today is to, to write some kind of a hook uh, script in Python to manipulate the DOM XML just before we pass it to Libvirt. So it's a good customization mechanism. If you want to leverage a Libvirt feature that is not yet available in Ovid, that would be a good way to do that. Another pluggable option is in the UI. We have, we have the, uh, the UI um, mechanism in place to be able to create new tabs. As you saw earlier, there are tabs for the big basic entities. But you create, can create your own tab for things you're interested in. For, uh, on. In. Sorry. 
So this specifically is an integration with uh, Foreman, if you're familiar with that. So how many people are here are familiar with Foreman? Yeah, OK. So maybe Nagios would be more popular, Nagios? Yeah, OK. So you can get events and monitoring statistics from the host. And this is an, uh, an example of UI integration, where you can see the Nagios and the statistics is from the host in a graph and, and the events from the host. So you have a way to add your own kind of main tab and, and sub tabs, which is the UI extension. As I mentioned, you can also customize the, your setup with um, uh, with um, we mentioned the UI. We add the scheduler. Okay. So we, you can also write your own scheduling mechanism, and hopefully going forward, you'll be able to customize more things in the, in the centralized management uh, going forward. That's something we want to work uh, on. OK, just a few bits about architecture, and that's it. OK, so from a really high level point of view is is to have the engine, which is the centralized management written in Java, and as I mentioned, the BDSM written in Python, the agent on the host. On the client side, you have a GWT-based UI. Um, you can use all, all the, all, all the REST-based uh, clients that I mentioned earlier. We have the Java, which is using database for, for persistence, specifically Postgres. We have, LDAP, we have integration with an LDAP, generally with any LDAP directory, specifically uh, also with the uh, Active Directory. I mean, any LDAP provider could be used for the application. Other than that, you can also use Active Directory. The engine is exposes the REST API, with, which you can use with the different clients. And on the host, there's the VDSM agent. And you can run, obviously, Windows and Linux virtual machines. In each of them, you have a guest agent. The guest agent is used to get to retrieve information from within the guest. For example, we're using that to retrieve the, uh, the networking uh, devices that the guest has. We're using that to uh, retrieve the applications that the guests have and for single sign-on from the uh, user portal. So it's quite useful. We have Spice is not an open project. It's a separate open source project, but it's, it, it's tailored for and optimized uh, for virtualization. You can use Spice either from Linux or from a Windows client. And we have the storage. The local storage is basically to utilize the disk that you have in your hypervisor. So if you use a host as a hypervisor and you want to be able to utilize the disk within it, the local storage would be the way to go. And the shared storage, which is, which is which enables a quite fast VM migration. Um, we currently have also storage live migration, so it should be able for also local storage, but we are not there yet. In the guest level, well, there are all the power virtual drivers for improving performance, like the built IO net, built IO block, built IO SCSI, that is not here, I believe. Um, and the balloon device. Um, balloon device is not for performance, it's for uh, inflating a balloon and deflating a balloon to make sure you have enough memory reserves. Um, there's the built IO serial driver. The guest agent is using that. Here it says REM agent. And this is all running on the guest. We have guest agent both for Linux and Windows, as I mentioned. OK. So to summarize, Ogrit is a management solution. It's built on top of Libvirt and KVM as lower level layers uh, levels. It offers a lot of orchestration level features. And it's an open source, quite stable, long term solution. Um, I think you'll enjoy using that if you, if you want to try it. Uh, I have a uh, live USB sticks. Uh, you can use to just you 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 allow USB. I mean, when you put it as a USB, you are all built up and running in your machine, like I show you in the demo. And if we have time, I'll give some time for questions. But if we have time, I want to extend the demo and show you some some of the other stuff you can, you can use. So, any questions before I'm? Yeah. 
So could you summarize the, the main benefit versus open stack? Why, I mean, why we need to over, over the uh, open stack? OK, I think it depends on the kind type of workload you're going to use. You're going to deploy on your, on your environment. So you probably have the paths versus kettle analogy. Well, when you care about your virtual machines, when you care about the state, and when the virtual machine, the application that runs within your virtual machine is not a stateless, it's like a pet. You, you give it a name, you care about it, you want to make sure this specific pet or this specific virtual machine is, is alive for some reason, then you would use open, which is more a data center virtualization solution. If you have like a more mass deployment, uh, like the cattle, when you don't give a name to each one, and it's like if one goes down, then you can bring, I'm talking about the virtual machines. If one virtual machine goes down, then you want to just launch another virtual machine that you don't care about the specific uh, details. And also that requires that your application would be cloud aware, which means either status or either the configuration is, is cloud aware, so you can configure it from the outside and keep your inner uh, application without a state, then you would use probably OpenStack. Although the border is it's not like a sharp, clear decision. This type of workload is definitely over, and this kind of workload is, is OpenStack. So they, they are kind of interchangeable. I would say that you should look into what functionality you actually need, and then what type of workload you actually going to execute on that virtualized environment, and then you will be able to make a good, clear choice. Yeah? How do you compare over to commercial environments such as VMware? When is it advisable to use over, and uh, where is it still again? OK, so first of all, it's about dollars, dollar amount. So if you're looking at about VMware, it's the pricing is, is much higher than over, right? Other than that, and then I would say that over is inspired or would like to be able to provide as much functionality as, as VMware. But well, I'm one thing, which is yeah, well, that's yeah, that's <laughs> obvious. <laughs> yeah, well, it's not a monopoly, and you don't have a vendor lock-in, which is obvious by the fact that you use an open source solution. And you can also in over we, for example, we also. They have all the, the community activity around it. And if you need a specific feature, you can go and ask for it, even on the community level. And the engineers would be engaged in providing a specific roadmap according to your needs, and not something that VMware is driving and you cannot have any influence on, to yes, some degree. Yes, yes. But for the functionality, I would say that in high availability, there's still yeah. There are some gaps. I'm not sure about specifically about high availability of your virtual machine. I'm not sure if there is a gap, maybe. Well, so does, does VMware have fault tolerance capabilities? That would be the one gap that Over did not have, right? So they have a fault tolerance which only works for virtual machines running on one side. Right. So that, that's something that's missing from Over, too. There yeah. is an open source project in fault tolerance. I think it's still not sure enough. Integrated into Over. I'd say that the important 80% of the VMware features are there. I think we probably need to take this discussion offline. Yeah. We've got to get the next presenter up. Yeah, thank you. So, what's the other thing? Thanks very much. Thank you.